Good morning to all of you. Welcome to this second day at ChangeNow 2021 and to our ocean restoration session. Is our ocean in good health? How can we protect it? And why shall we care about our ocean? During the next 75 minutes, we have the chance and the honor to welcome Vladimir Ryabinin, Alexandra Cousteau, Tommy Remengesso Jr., uh, Laura Clark, and Laura Doriol to answer those three questions and much more. And let's start right away with our first guest. While snorkeling in the Black Sea, he discovered an underwater city. This triggered his everlasting love for our ocean. He is an oceanographer, a marine engineer, a meteorologist, and a climatologist. He built outstanding mathematical models for the ocean and the atmosphere. He published hundreds of scientific publications. He is the executive secretary of the Intergovernmental Oceanographic Commission of the UNESCO and assistant director general of UNESCO. Let me welcome Dr. Vladimir Ryabinin. Dr. Ryabidin, good morning, and thank you for joining us at Change Now. How are you doing today? Uh, good morning, uh, Olivier, and good time of the day to, to the whole Change Now. So I'm very well. Thank you. Delighted to be with you. And uh, the, the question you uh, already asked is not an ordinary question this day, uh, these days. I hope you're well too, Olivier. Thank you. So when the whole world is trying to reduce greenhouse gas emissions to limit global warming, how comes a reputable climatologist focuses on the ocean decade? Well, I hope, Olivia, that you know what you say is indeed true. Uh, and the world is focusing on reducing the emissions. But you know, right now we need to know that uh, the, currently the world is heading towards a warming that is not 1.5 degree that was uh, assumed to, 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 to take place, but, but the year 2100. We are now heading to the world that is uh, uh, three to four degrees warmer. And for the Arctic, for example, this means even, even more warmer world. So that's what's happening. And uh, at least uh, for the climate, we have Paris Agreement, we have United Nations Framework Convention Climate Change. Nothing of that sort exists for the ocean. For the ocean, we're only coining first conventions. We're only attracting attention. But ocean is far away from people. You ask your own question, why should we care about the ocean? This is not also uh, a simple question because, you know, people don't live, most of them, people don't live in the ocean. They don't know what is happening in the ocean. So that's exactly why we need to understand what is happening there, what is the role of, uh, of ocean for our civilization, for people. And and change the situation because ocean is in a big trouble now, ladies and gentlemen. And we need to do something about this. And the decade is decade of ocean science. We need science to, uh, to understand what's happening and find solutions. Okay, thank you. And could you tell us more on what is the ocean decade and uh, what it would like to achieve? Thanks, Olivia. Uh, you know, so first of all, you know, every good thing requires time. You cannot just immediately change our attitude and change our knowledge of the ocean. This requires, well, something like 10 years. So, and I already said that there is a convention on climate. So we need to change the paradigm uh, in, in how we understand the ocean and what we uh, but what, what, what we can do with the ocean. The whole history of uh, oceanography is the history of the geographic discoveries that were based on the sense of curiosity. But now we need uh, something else. We need the science that leads to solutions. And because of that, the vision of the decade is the science we need for the ocean we want. And we convinced the United Nations uh, to conduct the decade, and they had the wisdom of accepting our proposal, we being in the Government Oceanographic Commission of UNESCO, because we spoke about the ocean we need for the future we want. So we need some good future. For that, we need some good ocean, you know, some healthy ocean, and this requires science, because the whole world is now becoming more and more science-dependent, science-intensive. So who would know about what is happening with climate without scientific knowledge? You know, I heard so many uh, ambassadors speaking about the role of the ocean, saying that 93% of excess heat ends up in the ocean. But I think 
uh, not many people know what is the work that goes behind such numbers. What are the observations, how they are processed, and how this information is then uh, resulting in actions and, and decisions. So that's exactly uh, what we're trying to achieve. We're trying to mainstream the ocean science that now receives less than 2% of the uh, investment into uh, natural sciences, and this is wrong for the 70% of the area of the planet, and we need to change that paradigm. We need to uh, mainstream the science, and explain what it means, and try to find solutions that would be addressing such things like climate change, such things like uh, poverty, hunger, uh, such things that uh, the second fastest period of extinction of species that we are going now in 415 million years. Well, because there was one period of extinction of species 65 years ago related to a meteorite. But now we, we did it all ourselves. So we need to find solutions for that. And that is the motivation, Olivia, for, for the decade. Thank you. And if I understand well, uh, the, the ocean decade is first and foremost about knowing the ocean better. And could this increased knowledge create additional threats to our ocean? For example, mapping extensively the seabed could result in the development of uh, destructive seabed mining. Well, this question, Olivier, of course, uh, reveals your 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 good understanding of human nature. Okay, uh, but in principle, I would like to say that uh, this is not the first decade. Uh, and the first decade was organized by also in the Government Oceanographic Commission of UNESCO in the 1970s. And that decade was called International Decade of Ocean Exploration. See the difference, please. This is decade of uh, United Nations, of ocean science for sustainable development. That's exactly the point. And we would like to, uh, to achieve that the better knowledge of the ocean does not result in destruction of the ocean. That's exactly the point. And uh, better knowledge now, if it is used well, can only uh, help us to, to live in harmony with the ocean. Okay, thank you. This is reassuring. And what, what are the ocean decade main challenges? Uh, so, in the decade, we would like to achieve uh, seven outcomes. Clean, productive, resilient, safe, uh, inspiring and engaging ocean, healthy ocean. Well, you can easily see when I say experience, this is quality is not really of the ocean, it's qualities of people. So, that, that is what we're trying to achieve. But uh, the challenges of the decade are, uh, well, actually, this is a term, and we uh, call by challenges initial areas of work. So, we need to understand the ocean pollutants, multi-stressors that affect the ocean, get rid of the pollution. And everyone knows about plastic, but this is not the only thing. For example, we have a lot of medications dissolved in water now. Uh, this uh, should lead to better understanding and, uh, of ocean ecosystems, which are complex, and we know roughly 10% uh, percent of ocean species. This will help us to make ocean uh, healthier. With that, we will be able to generate more food from the ocean that is so needed, but do it sustainably. And uh, generating food is just a part of ocean economy. The ocean economy can really th thrive uh, also sustainably. This will be happening under conditions of changing climate. So we need to, to work on the ocean, next, ocean climate nexus. For example, the future of carbon in the ocean. We have so much carbon in the ocean that the ocean may reduce its capacity to absorb carbon. This will affect uh, our future. And uh, changing climate will lead to, for example, changing tropical cyclones. We need to manage risks coming from the ocean. So these are the tasks. And for that, we need scientific tasks. We need to manage uh, uh, or develop observing system for the ocean, uh, for polar regions, for deep ocean, not only for physical variables that we have now, but also biology, ecology, even social matters. We need to turn these observations and data processing into digital twin. We call it digital ecosystem of the ocean. So everyone could really represent in scientific way uh, the state of the ocean. But the you know, capacity of uh, countries to do so are totally different. We need to make sure that no one is left behind. We need capacity development for the world. And most importantly, this all should converge in changing our behavior towards the ocean. Human relations with ocean should be really human, 
like between humans. Thank you. That's that's the challenge of the decay, Bolivia. Mm. And so that that's very interesting. But I, I would like to ask: Do you have any very concrete example? Because a lot of people they believe that the ocean is is very huge and it's too big to fix. So, do you have some concrete examples of actions that have already been taken to 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 help the ocean uh, be, be restored and uh, and go in the right direction? That, that is, a, you know, you know, previously uh, people thought that the ocean was too big to, to uh, and so invincible so they could do anything with it. Now they think <laughs> they have, it's ocean too big to fix. Uh, you know, uh, yes, it is possible. And I can give you some examples. Uh, first of all, uh, uh, let me uh, say that, you know, we were able to, uh, during the last years, uh, using uh, the project, which is called Sibet 2030, uh, that is uh, helped by the Nippon Foundation and also is working with IUC and the International uh, uh, Hydrographic Organization, to increase uh, the percentage of the area for which we know the ocean depths from 5%. And this is much less than we know for Mars and other side of the moon to 19%. So it took us uh, 100 years since 1903 to arrive at the 5%. And in four or five years, we increased that number to 19%. This is, uh, shows our ability to know more about the ocean. But then we, uh, we already have a, a, a possibility to warn about tsunamis. How many people lives, people's life were, were saved because of that? This is because uh, of some science, because of seismic uh, stations, because of the system of processing the data, knowing how uh, which kind of earthquakes may result in, in which tsunamis and the height and things like this. So people uh, now enjoy a more reliable weather prediction. And this is, was my part uh, also of, of, my, of my work in the past. So, uh, you know, I can quote one of my uh, esteemed colleagues who said, you know, if you uh, enjoy a good weather prediction for two days, you can thank a meteorologist. If you have good weather prediction for five days, thank an oceanographer. We can now predict El Nino that is having devastating events on the ocean. And the Paris Agreement itself was saved, I think, by oceanographers because we showed that there was no hiatus in global warming because the, the, the heat was going into the ocean. Fishery management, we have now good, uh, good uh, uh, progress in certain areas and when it was possible to restore fish stocks, manage them. And we hear in news uh, some quarrels about the fishermen but these squirrels are coming because there is some scientific management and they know that they have to be restricted on certain things. So we can now predict uh, harmful algal blooms. We can uh, work uh, so that seafood is less, uh, uh, you know, less uh, on the risk of, of certain diseases. So, you know, I can go, I think, uh, too long for this interview with examples of how science can contribute to, uh, to, uh, to, to so many problems and uh, really bring up solutions. But we, but we can do more. Thank you. And but hearing you, what, what I hear is that, that there are so many stakeholders around the ocean. Uh, so the ocean is one and we have so many stakeholders so when you're talking about the ocean decay, and I guess there are uh, financial resources that are needed, who is supporting the ocean decay, and how will you manage to engage everybody? Well, we need to change uh, indeed uh, the, the pattern. You know, uh, indeed, uh, the ocean health is in decline. And, you know, uh, everyone breathes uh, oxygen that comes from the ocean. So it's uh, a matter for everyone. Uh, indeed, uh, the decade should, I think, involve everyone. And we are going to have a special campaign called Generation Ocean to explain to people how they are connected to the ocean. And even if their profession or their life is not directly connected to the ocean, they are connected. But this is about ordinary people. But in principle, uh, we have uh, indeed a lot of stakeholders. We are starting from ground zero uh, in the terms of resources, in terms of money. But, you know, the excitement and engagement is, is increasing. And the plan for the decade uh, was created with thousands and thousands of people 
Uh, so they contributed their wisdom and knowledge. We're creating engagement mechanisms. There will be soon a forum uh, to discuss the decade. Uh, on the 8th of June, which is the World Oceans Day, I'm going to announce to the world around more than 30 different decade programs, and you will be amazed. This is not only about hard science that people may be afraid of engaging. This is about culture, underwater culture. This is about the role of women in science, uh, about the role of early career ocean professionals. So indeed, like you mentioned, there are uh, many stakeholders and everyone can participate and can contribute, big or small, but we will be creating that environment in which we can all work together. Uh, so look at the, uh, at the D uh, Decade website, oceandecade.org. It's going to be revamped soon. And uh, we also are creating communities of practice. So people who will be working in certain areas will be able to code design co-create science. So it is the most important thing that we are together in this business. And so, and this will uh, have, uh, I think, uh, enjoyment and, you know, uh, excitement for, uh, for uh, different types, for different people, but, you know, for really for all. Thank you. And what, what, one stakeholder uh, that I been, saw some work uh, from is the High Level Panel for Sustainable Ocean Economy. Um, what is the relation between the Ocean Decade and uh, the High Level Panel for Sustainable Ocean Economy? Uh, the, indeed, I know who you're talking about. It was a prominent uh, member and is a prominent member of, of High Level Panel, even a co-chair of the panel, uh, Tommy Raymond Gisso, the, the former president of Palau. Yeah, this panel was a, a revolution. We would like to have a revolution, indeed, in, in the ocean science. And this panel is now, uh, indeed, moving towards a revolution. So... Uh, uh, we were on the advisory group of, of the panel, uh, and uh, the panel is now uh, has developed a vision, and that vision is incredibly important. Uh, it is possible to generate six times more food from the ocean, 40 times more energy from the ocean, uh, to increase the size of ocean economy and do this all sustainably. If we change uh, the investment into the ocean, if we bring uh, this to uh, national uh, accounting, if we stop pollution from land, and if we design and use plans for the, uh, for the ocean, for the ocean management. And the fifth condition is the data, you know, but it's not just only data, the data that is useful. So the decade will be able to generate the knowledge, the plans, uh, also the societal uh, uh, connections and so social science to implement indeed, to help implement the vision of the high level panel. 14 heads of state and government in the panel move now towards managing the ocean sustainably. It means on the basis of science. And we will be able to engage and help them to increase that number. So most, most countries of the world, by the year 2030, will be managing their ocean area sustainably. So, you know, high-level panel deliberations, high-level panel commitments, and the decade go hand-in-hand hand towards uh, having the ocean that we want and that we need. Thank you, Dr. Rabinin. Congratulations for all you are doing. And thank you very much for sharing your vision with us today. Thank you very much for having me, Olivia. Good so luck thanks for you now. Yeah, thanks to all of you for, for listening. I will now leave the floor to Christian Lim. So, hi, Christian. Hi, Olivier. Hi, Dr. Rabinin. Thank you very much for. Uh, a very much eye-opening uh, discussion. Uh, so my name is Christian Lim. I'm a co-founder of uh, Blue Oceans Partners, uh, and we invest in innovations for the regeneration of ocean health. And it is, it is my immense pleasure uh, to welcome someone uh, who not only is he's, um, has a, is from a legacy, long-standing legacy of exploration of the ocean, uh, but who is also uh, an explorer of the ocean in her own right, and an explorer of solutions to restore uh, the, uh, uh, the, the health of the ocean. So please welcome uh, uh, Alexandra Cousteau, uh, with whom I'm sure we're going to have a delightful uh, and inspiring discussion in the next 20 minutes. Alexandra. Hi, Christian. Hi, Alexandra. How are you? <laughs> I'm good this morning. How are you? I'm good, and it's a great pleasure to 
see you again uh, after, I think, uh, two years. Uh, <laughs> Since the last conference, I think. Yes, exactly. So uh, a lot has happened in the last two years. Um, but I, I would like to start the conversation actually by stepping back a little bit, uh, even and uh, looking at uh, the history of our relationship uh, with the ocean. Um, I think last time we spoke, you told me that we we moved from initially, uh, you know, uh, the uh, a relationship of uh, uh, of wonder and maybe you know fear in some ways of the ocean. And then there was exploration, and then there was conservation, and then something else came. So I'd like to read your perspective on how this evolution, uh, relationship has evolved over, and where we are now. Well, I've, I've been watching this evolution my whole life, Christian, because, mm. you know, I um, could swim before I could walk. My, mm. my parents took me on my first expedition when I was just four months old, and to be honest, the the story of the ocean that I've witnessed, in spite of my family's best efforts, has been one of continual loss every year. Uh, and um, and it's really remarkable because when my grandfather first started exploring the oceans back in the 1950s and when my father really uh, came of age and joined him in the 1960s and started articulating this ethic of conservation for the ocean, this idea that the oceans are precious and, um, and, and should be protected for communities, human communities, and, and because they have uh, their own value. And, and so I think that that um, conservation ethics served the last generation really well, and we were able to advance many things um, in service of the oceans. And yet, today, we can see that we've lost half of our oceans, half of the whales and fish that swam in the oceans when my father and grandfather first started exploring them are gone. And so I think, well, at least to me, it means that we are now in a place where we need to reimagine our relationship to the ocean and really focus on creating a new solutions pathway um, that is centered on restoration of lost abundance, regenerating and rebuilding marine biodiversity so that by 2050, uh, we aren't uh, living in a world where there's more plastic than fish in the ocean but we've actually rebuilt our oceans and our children are enjoying the abundance that our fathers and grandfathers knew. I think the really good news, and I know, Christian, that you know this as well, is that science tells us that this is possible. You know, we think that it's too late for the oceans, that we've lost so much that, that there's no going back. And yet we have this next decade, this window of opportunity to bring it back, to put in place the measures that we need to put in place to bring it back. And <clears throat> science is a huge part of that. But I think that these new developing technologies that are coming online are also a really exciting opportunity to create fundamental change in how we manage the ocean so that we can actually manage it for abundance rather than keeping it at a place of scarcity and continuing to take, take, take without really putting anything back. Uh, thank you, Alexandra, and, and, and we'll, we'll dwell uh, deeper into you know, this, this uh, opportunity of uh, innovation. But before that, uh, I'd, I'd like to, uh, uh, you know, we all, I think everyone who cares about the ocean goes, in from this, uh, you know, this journey, goes through this journey of uh, you know, understanding that we have to move away, I mean, move from conservation to restoration, as you're putting it so well. Uh, I, I'm interested in, in in learning if um, in your uh, you know what your journey has been personally is there any moment any experience any discussion you know that led you you know uh, that uh, clicked in your mind and, and that made you to this you know realize this and, and make it one of your central messages to the world well i i grew up obviously um, participating in my family's work and and watching it up close and seeing the impact that um, my grandfather had, notably um, his work to help put in place protections for Antarctica, which is the first time in history that 
um, we were able to protect an entire continent, and those protections remain today. Um, so that you know happened when I was eight years old, and um, yeah. I went around my community gathering signatures for my grandfather's petition, and it was really my yeah. first sort of act of advocacy, and um, and it's just continued from there. Um, there's there's been lots of ways that I have tried to continue to advance my father's legacy and um, this idea that that we have to protect our oceans. But it wasn't until after I had my children and and my time horizon expanded um, significantly, as I think all parents do. You start thinking about your child's lifetime, and I realized that, um, you know, it, this was also at the time when everybody was talking about this new calculation that had just been um, shared that, that by 2050 we could have more plastic than fish in the ocean. And it was then that I called a good friend of mine, Professor Carlos Duarte, who's, I think, one of the foremost marine biologists in the world now, and, and asked his advice. And I, I said, you know, is it, is it inevitable that we're going to continue to degrade our oceans year after year after year and see these net losses um, to the point where my children will be the generation of my family that writes the obituary for the ocean that my grandfather and my father explored in all of its generosity? Um, or is there a chance that we can actually turn this around and start rebuilding our oceans and get back to a place of abundance? What does the science tell you, Carlos? And he said, you know, something that I've, I've come to expect from him now, which is that uh, he said, you know, I'm, I'm writing a scientific paper about this right now, uh, which is usually his response to my questions, which is wonderful. Um, and, and indeed, he did publish uh, a paper in Nature last year um, that shows us a roadmap to rebuilding our oceans from a scientific perspective. And it also shows us that for, you know, every dollar that we spend rebuilding marine biodiversity, we can expect about a $10 return. And so um, that has become the foundation of everything that I'm working on today is really looking for the catalysts that can help us return to an abundant ocean. And, um, and that's been tremendously encouraging to me and heartening because it's hard work to be slogging through the trenches sometimes and, and working to, to stop the damage. Um, but when you shift your perspective and you start focusing on the pathways that can lead to regeneration, um, that's tremendously exciting. And I think it's a paradigm shift that can really take us in the right direction. I, I agree with you so much. And, uh, uh, and, and just to, uh, to tell you how much this resonates with uh, with me personally, but also I think the entire uh, ocean innovation, uh, you know, community. Uh, I think I see more and more. It's been the case for for us as Blue Oceans Partners. We have shifted actually from investing for con conservation to uh, investing for the restoration of ocean health. And I see more and more, uh, you know, in this broad ocean innovation community, actually shifting to this uh, to this new stance. So, and I must say. Uh, the inspiration for this, at least for me, came from our last conversation two years ago. So thank you for this. Um, and um, so, uh, Alexandra, maybe um, uh, it would be, uh, uh, I would love to hear some examples, con concrete examples of those innovations that can help us uh, regenerate uh, ocean health. Can you tell us about this? Well, you know, fisheries is a great example of an industry that mm. needs radical reshaping and rethinking. Um, well, fisheries have been around for as long as humans have, really, and, and have helped shape our cultures and, and, and you know, our history in many places. Um, they are at the brink of collapse, and there's a lot of really bad practices that have been around for a while. And I think that um, you know, we saw fisheries really get destructive for the oceans in the 80s when there was uh, a whole raft of new technologies that were developed. And we saw the shift from cotton nets to nylon nets, which led to ghost nets floating around the ocean. And we saw refrigeration boats, which meant that, you know, big trawlers could just fish 24 hours a day, yeah. seven days a week. And then yeah. rather than going back to port, they could just unload into these refrigeration ships. And so it put a lot more pressure on fish stocks around the world. And, you know, 30 years ago, 20 years ago, I thought, 
gosh, you know, how are we ever going to be able to police the open ocean? It seems like the Wild West. It, it feels like this unsolvable problem. And yet, as technology has advanced and people have worked tirelessly on innovating and thinking and developing new ways of policing our oceans. We've seen um, organizations like Oceana work with Google and SkyTruth to launch the Global Fishing Watch, which allows us to track um, fishing vessels um, across the oceans. And, and actually, even when it was just in its beta phase, it was able to intercept illegal fishing practices and notify small wow. developing nations that there was illegal fishing happening in their waters, which they never would have known otherwise. Yeah. And it led to being able to seize the ship and the catch and, and, and apply significant fines. Um, and that has continued. I know, Christian, you, you have a relationship with Unseen Labs, which is taking that even further to the next yeah. step. That's really exciting. And I think that, yeah. you know, as Carlos tells me often, marine biologists have advanced our understanding of our oceans yeah. tremendously. And while it's true that we know more about the surface of the moon than we know about the bottom of the ocean, yeah. we continue to understand more and more every year. But there is a real need for other in, in, you know, fields of knowledge to get involved as well, engineers and yeah. technologists and data scientists and um, all sorts of uh, different fields so that we can actually go further and accelerate you know, technology that can allow us to restore our coral reefs before it's too late, that can help us track and monitor illegal fishing from the sky, that can really transform kind of a new wave of technology, unlike in the 80s, which was mostly destructive for the oceans. This new wave of technology that we're seeing now, I think, will be incredibly beneficial for the oceans and will allow us to do things that, you know, none of us thought would be possible 20 years ago. Yeah. No, I mean, I agree with you. I'm, we're, we're so excited about those technologies, and this is why you know, we're dedicating our life's work to, to helping them scale rapidly, because we need urgently to, to have them uh, you know, at work. Uh, however, I, I can't help but wonder, you know, when I see those very powerful technologies, and you know, for some of them, we're talking about artificial intelligence, you know, satellites, uh, powerful uh, you know, biology, uh, uh, biotechnologies. Uh, I can't help but you know, wonder, it has the potential to be beneficial, but does it have also the potential to hurt the ocean just as it, it has in the 80s? Uh, what is it different today that, uh, you know, uh, that uh, makes us confident that we will not repeat the same mistakes as we've done with the powerful technologies of the 80s, uh, Alexandra? It's a great question, Christian. I think there is no promise that it won't. Um, that depends entirely on us um, and, the, and the choices that we make today and moving forward. Um, there, there are a few things that I think are, are positive signs. Um, one is that the oceans are, are becoming more transparent. Um, we're able to understand more not only about how oceans work, but how we are impacting the oceans. And that information is increasingly in the public. Um, so as every year passes, there will be less and less secrets. And, and, um, and that's important because it gives people an opportunity to participate in the decision making to the extent that they want to. I wish people who were more involved in, in raising their voices to eliminate harmful fisheries subsidies and to um, support important fisheries regulations. And I know that that's not that sexy. So um, it's probably not going to take off like wildfire on social media. <laughs> but I think that as we move forward, those are going to be things that all of us need to have a voice in shaping. And young people are increasingly engaged and involved and being heard and, and being listened to. And so... That's incredibly helpful. Um, the oceans, as you know, Christian, are the least funded of the social, um, the, the global goals. And, and that's a problem. It's, it's incredible to me that they are at the bottom of the list. And philanthropy alone is not going to bridge that gap. So the, the fact that there are so many people like you who are looking at using all sorts of different financial instruments to drive investment um, into oceans is also really helpful to me because we need those funds to be allocated 
differently than they've been allocated in the past, but we also need to attract new sources of funding to creating those changes. Um, and I think all of that is going to help us move in the right direction and help avoid that, that what you mentioned about, about making the same mistakes. And finally, I think there is a real importance to articulating our ambitions. If we are going to get to a better place, we need a vision of where to go. And so words like sustainability have lost their meaning for me in a lot of ways. Sustainability is a reference marker. You could sustain someone in a coma for decades. Um, and that's increasingly what's happening with the ocean. So for me, transitioning to different words to articulate what we want to accomplish is that important. And so talking about regenerative blue economy at restoring ocean abundance, um, those kinds of that kind of language is going to be key to making sure that the documents that we write and the aspirations that we share and the vision that we set for the future is really what we want, so that we can get there. Yeah, thank you. And um, so I, I heard two things uh, from what you're saying. One is we need transparency to to ensure we're not making the same mistakes as before, uh, and here, technologies can help bring this transparency, the Global Fishing Watch, the, the, the Sky Truth, and the Unseen Labs of this world. Uh, and the second part of what you were saying is that we need, we need to scale up financing for, for, the, for you know, the restoration of the ocean. And which means, and I come from the, fin you know, the financial world, so I, I'm trying to translate for those out there who are in power and, and actually you know, can make those decisions, uh, we need to... Uh, to have mainstream institutions uh, invest, uh, invest in uh, the restoration of ocean health. Um, and uh, I think we see increasingly models that demonstrate that this can be done and can be done profitably because at the end of the day, we're generating tremendous value for the planet and for humanity. So this value translates into you know, profits. So there's a business case as well to do this. And so, we just have a, you know, a few minutes left in our conversation, unfortunately, but let's say if you were talking to those, you know, uh, to those leaders of large financial institutions, um, what, what will, would you say and actually what are you telling them <laughs> so that this happens, we get mainstream in, in this effort? Um, you know, I think that uh, when I look at a lot of the sustainability initiatives in the corporate sector, it feels very boilerplate and it feels very 1990s, right? Just paying lip service to sustainability and making sure that you say the right things and you're giving some money away. Um, I, I feel strongly that the companies that will thrive in the future are the ones that treat their consumers as contributors to a common vision of a more abundant world. Mm. And when they are fully accounting for their carbon footprint and not just buying cheap carbon offsets to be able to write about it in their, in their annual sustainability report, when they're really taking this seriously and making people into their partners to reach you know, a different place, that's, those are the companies that will succeed because that's what people want now. They don't want greenwashing and they see right through it. Um, and we know how companies, no matter how big they are, can fall in an instant um, because technology changes or the winds of chance change and, 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 and people want different things. I think just like, you know, people switched from 35 millimeter film to digital cameras and, and you know, Kodak you know, went from being one of the top companies to, to not having a, a, an industry anymore. Mm. We're going to see people demanding different things and companies that can provide that transparency and provide that commitment and provide that opportunity to be part, to really contribute to building the world that we want are the ones that will succeed. Now, there was um, a few years ago, I was filming um, in Vermont um, and, and looking yeah. at the story of a, of a Vermont dairy farmer who had taken his entire operation organic so that he wouldn't contribute to the blue-green algae 
um, blooms in Lake Champlain. And after a day spent on his farm, I asked him, you know, how do all of these significant changes that you've invested in, how does it feel now that you've done it? Yeah. And he said, I feel amazing because for the first time in my life, I'm able to align my values with my actions, and I feel like I'm leaving a better world for my children. And I thought that was really profound, hmm. but um, I was about to have my baby, and so <laughs> I didn't really think about it again until a few months later, I was hosting a documentary on organic cotton for National yeah. Geographic. And I was in Madhya Pradesh in India in the middle of nowhere talking to an organic cotton farmer who had taken his entire plot organic in spite of all of the tremendous challenges that he had faced. And at the end of the day, I said, you know, how does this make you feel to have accomplished this? And he said, I feel amazing because for the first time in my life, I'm able to align my values with my actions and I feel like I'm leaving a better world for my children. And it was then that I really understood that being able to live in alignment with the things that we believe to be right is a fundamental human need that is really not available to us in this modern world where we need things that are wrapped in plastic. We need things that come from, um, you know, supply chains that are not transparent, that may be contributing to problems that we care deeply about. And there's this feeling of powerlessness to be able to do anything about it. And we're starting to see change and we're starting to see innovation because I think that's what companies are noticing is that people want to be able to live in alignment with what they think is right and the kind of world that they want to live in. And so the companies that are able to provide that to their, their consumers are the ones that will thrive. I really believe that. Yeah, thank you, Alexandra, for this powerful message. Um, and uh, I think you're, you know, you're showing us that there is a path. Uh, and so I hope we can all join in this journey and, uh, and make our ocean and our planet uh, better and restore the health of our ocean. So thank you very much, uh, Alexandra. Um, and uh, I you, hope Christian. we can have a, a next chat and we'll see it really lines moving next time we, we speak and we meet. <laughs> I hope you. so, in person. <laughs> yeah, well, indeed, indeed. So uh, <laughs> thank you very much. And uh, now uh, I would like to hand over uh, to Nora, Nora Herbi. Uh, she is the founder of, of Who Cares Chronicles. Uh, and we're going to have a in, in, very inspiring discussion with her and her guests. Thank you very much. Hi everyone, I'm so delighted to be here today on day two of Change Now to speak about ocean restoration with two of the most incredible um, savers of our ocean. Uh, it's an honor to introduce you to a conversation that was recorded earlier in Palau with uh, President, former President Tommy Romengasau and Laura Clark, the co-founder of the Palau Pledge. Good morning, Laura. Good morning, Mr. President. Uh, it is an honor for us at Change Now to have you here today um, and to, to share with us your, your knowledge, wisdom, and expertise. Laura, um, I will start with you, and uh, thank you so much for being here this morning. Um, I, I, it, was, it is an honor for us to have you here and speak of your commitment and your work with the Palau government. Um, I, I will let you take on and um, and, and, and tell us more about your role and uh, the relationship you have established with the Palau government and Mr. President Tommy Romengasau present here today. Thank you, Nora. Um, well, I'm very pleased to be here. I think we both are. I'm very uh, honored to be joined by the former president of the Republic of Palau, Tommy E. Romengasau Jr. Um, and thank you for asking us to talk with you today. Um, I have a few questions that um, I'm going to ask uh, the president um, about his time in office. And so I think really and truly the first one, um, Mr. President, is you were president for 16 years um, and in total. And during your time in office, you instigated uh, some incredible world first conservation policies and laws to protect the environment and culture of Palau. Um, and for those people that don't know in the audience, I'm just going to briefly give a very top line explanation of some of those. So the Palau National Marine Sanctuary, which is the largest percentage of fully protected maritime territory in the world. The Palau Pledge, 
which is another world first, the first mandatory promise to protect environment and culture that all visitors have stamped in their passports and that they must sign before entering Palau to protect the future generations of Palau. You also banned reef toxic sunscreen and single use plastic amongst many others. So I guess I'm really, really interested for you to tell us today how Palauan culture and heritage influenced um, the laws and policies that the Palau government instigated and maybe what um, some other countries could learn from Palau's culture of conservation. Thank you, Laura, and certainly it's good to be here uh, to be with you guys. Uh, first of all, uh, um, Palau is no different uh, really from many small island countries surrounded by vast oceans and, and scarce land resource. So you get to live in a society and grow up in a, in a community that uh, respects the ocean, respects the land, and uh, we know that it is our life and survival. If you don't protect the mother goose that lay the golden egg, then that's the future. So we've uh, basically, it was uh, uh, doing the Palau National Marine Sanctuary and all these other policies uh, really was to take what we traditionally and culturally believed in and lived in and put into the law of the land to make it even stronger. And I think uh, we managed to do that. Uh, the Palau National Marine Sanctuary makes uh, sense. Um, if you're going to harvest from the ocean, um, then there's only a limit, a limitation to how, how long and how much you can harvest. You need to protect also, you need to conserve. And that's, uh, that's the lesson in life that we, you only take what you need today and you take uh, what uh, and you save and protect what you don't need because tomorrow is going to come and future generations are going to come. The, we call it the bull, B-U-L, and basically it, it for endorses the, the scientific uh, uh, notion that uh, you, you protect the place not only to benefit that protected area, but there's a spillover factor that also goes to the other areas in which people can fish or harvest. So this is not just for Palau. This is also for our neighboring islands and really for the, for the world to protect and make sure that there's a spillover benefits to everything. The, the, um, the uh, Palau legacy uh, again makes rational sense because uh, we, we're all in this together, whether you're a tourist or a children or a resident of Palau, we need to educate ourselves that uh, this is a responsibility that we all share. Palau being dependent on ecotourism, uh, it's our life and bread and butter. And therefore we ask our uh, incoming guests to please you know, take care of the environment, please uh, protect it and ensure that it is the way uh, when you live it is the way we, that you found it. So uh, a lot of these things uh, really came from the resource owners, the, the fishermen uh, or the, the grassroots. Uh, and, and I think the lesson that uh, uh, can be shared with uh, every other countries is that uh, this is something not, that shouldn't just happen in Palau or the Pacific. This is a responsibility that uh, if you care about your children, if you care about the future generations, then you, we need to be serious about the kinds of policies and, account and the kind of developments that needs to be in place. Otherwise, uh, at the rate that development is going, uh, we know that uh, it's not sustainable. And so we have to make the right moral and right decisions in this day and age. Thank you for that. Thank you for that. One of the, um, I think, most moving parts of my time living in Palau was learning from my Palauan friends that the traditional notion of inheritance is the ocean and the land that you leave behind for the next generation. And I think that's something that we lose touch with in larger countries and fast paced environments and lives. And that our impact, you know, we have to think about that 
what kind of planet are we leaving behind? And that traditional notion has stayed with me um, wherever I go outside of Palau. So I just uh, wanted to say that. Thank you for that. And, um, uh, if I can reiterate that, uh, Laura, uh, the, in, the word inheritance uh, is also sometimes uh, can be tricky because we are not really inheriting the ocean and the land. We are borrowing it from our future generations. And therefore, it should be, you know, um, approached it that way, not simple inheritance for you to enjoy it now. You know, you're actually borrowing it. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you for that. Yeah, it's very, very important. And my next question is that Palau and Palauan children in particular, along with Pacific Islanders, are really truly on the front line of the climate crisis, which is extremely worrying, especially given, you know, the fact that the Pacific Islands don't contribute to the causes behind the climate crisis. And I think what I'd like to know is what are some of the things that you think that larger countries can do to help reverse these issues um, to relieve the burden on the Pacific Islands? Well, thank you, Laura. First of all, the, the Paris uh, Agreement was a good start uh, for many countries to sign on that something needed to be done. But now it's getting to the point where you have to put your money where your mouth is. You have to walk the talk. And many countries around the world do have government funds that they uh, invest. So maybe one of the things that uh, we could all do is uh, fund the environmentally, so, environmental social government governance. Uh, put the money into solutions that will take care of the problems and not continue to fund uh, ventures and businesses that are really causing the problems that we're in today. I think that goes a long way to really ensuring that uh, whether it's technology or whether it's uh, new methodology uh, or new ways of doing business uh, can go a long way if we are serious about uh, ESG. You know. And uh, Palau is, uh, is doing that. We're putting our social security funding into ESG funds. We're doing our, we're doing our pension plans. We're doing our power uh, investments um, uh, portfolios in uh, ESG uh, portfolios. So it goes to show that uh, many other countries can make a very big difference in research, in, in marketing, in education, in uh, awareness, if they just fund the, the kind of things that are very much needed in today's world. Uh, I would also quickly say that uh, um, we need to really enhance our awareness of the role of what the ocean means to, to the future of the world, whether it's the economy of the world. Uh, if, if, if you want our economy to be sustainable, the ocean has a lot to do with how that future is going to look like. And so we need to protect more of our ocean. We need to make eco uh, tourism uh, decisions and, and businesses that are not contributing to the causes of the problem. And if I may quickly add, uh, Laura, there's another very uh, uh, sensitive uh, undertaking now that you see around the world, uh, and that has to do with deep sea mining. Uh, unfortunately, we don't know a lot about what the impact of doing deep sea mining will do. Uh, but we do know that companies are rushing uh, to the Pacific and other parts of the world to, to do this. So I think it's important that we take a pause. I think it's important uh, that uh, larger countries come together and, and work with the scientists for all of us to better understand what is the, uh, the impact that such a, a venture will do. There's so much that we still don't know yet about what's underneath the ocean. But we do know that without the ocean, there's, there can be no life on, on Earth, on the planet. And so I think it's uh, important that uh, those kind of discussions uh, 
be really seriously uh, held and solutions undertaken. Thank you for that. Absolutely. Um, you know, again, I learned from my Palauan friends that the ocean is responsible for every second breath we take. And, you know, disturbing an ancient ecosystem, which is potentially keeping us alive uh, without, you know, the full scientific investigation into what that might do um, is, yeah, is perilous, I think. So thank you for raising that. It's a very important and very topical issue this year, I think, um, with so many decisions potentially being made around it. So actually that brings me into, uh, it's a nice segue into the next question, which is, what do you feel the role of big business, big corporates are in helping mitigate the climate crisis right now? Well, uh, what I do want to say is uh, for big businesses and industries, uh, they need to innovate and navigate themselves out of the, the problems that they're causing right now. Um, and I truly believe it can be done. If there's a will, there's a way. Uh, but we've got to be... Uh, make that decision first, the political will to do it, the, the, the uh, resources that needs to back whatever needs to be done. But there's a way, there's a way that we can mitigate these problems. And I think businesses uh, uh, are on the forefront of uh, leading the way. You know, if they lead the way, uh, governments also will, uh, will see the wisdom in what we're all trying to do. But that's... Uh, Unfortunately, um, there's, uh, there's always that shareholder um, concern that uh, companies need to make money as soon as possible. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think the younger generation, I'm very happy to know that money is not everything these days to the younger generation. They, they realize it's their future. And so we we shouldn't always look at the profit margin as the number one priority. We should also look at, uh, you know, the sustainability and the livelihood of our children as also a priority and balance uh, business with what needs to be done. I think that's, uh, that's going to happen. Unfortunately, maybe not with the older generation, but I do hope and I, I have confidence that it's, it's the young people because it's their future and they will have to do something about it. Well, it's interesting, isn't it? Because, you know, um, as you know, governments come and go, administrations come and go, but some of the biggest brands on the planet stay around for many, many years. And, you know, they have a lot of power. And, you know, I think what we've observed with young people around the world rising up and saying that they're demanding action now, like you said, we can't just look at the short term profits, we have to look at the longer term impact. And, you know, businesses need to understand that if we do not protect the planet, there isn't going to be a business um, in, you know, in years to come. And that's the reality. Um, and so, yeah, I am also very heartened by our young people around the world who are demanding action from business. So it's great to see that. Thank you for your comments. Um, actually, it's, a, a, again, a really good segue because Palau is going to host the seventh Our Ocean Conference. Um, and I wanted to ask you, why uh, is our ocean conference so important to the future of the ocean and, and ocean health? The, the best thing about the our ocean conference uh, is, is the partnership aspect of it. Uh, it's not just about standing up and making a speech. Uh, it's about the partnership that needs to take place between governments and leaders and business leaders the community, the scientists, all of us need to come together and talk about solutions, not describing the problem. And to me, that's the value of the Our Ocean Conference. Every ocean conference, they've always uh, um, made commitments, uh, made uh, contributions, uh, whether through legislations or whether through donors uh, or sponsorships. But that's what it's going to take, a partnership, partnership, partnership. And that's the value of the Our Ocean Conference. I, I also am excited because, uh, as you know, it's a separate SDG 14. Uh, 
uh, when you talk about poverty, when you talk about economy, when you talk about health, you have to talk about the ocean. And, and so it's, um, it, it was good that uh, um, the world through the United Nations uh, uh, saw climate change not just an important uh, area, but also the role of the ocean that it plays in every other aspect of uh, uh, sustain, sustaining a healthy and, and a better world for all of us. So in that sense, uh, that's the excitement uh, about the Our Ocean Conference. And I hope that uh, the COVID uh, situation around the world uh, improves definitely. Uh, but uh, again, the, it's, a, it's an important partnership solution-based uh, conference and I'm excited about it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's, um, it's uh, very exciting because it is a solution-based conference and, and it is very important. And I think it's absolutely incredible that Palau is going to be host hosting it and is going to do so in a way where we hope that other, you know, other countries, other leaders from business and government will see the way that Palau and culture has influenced Palau's laws and policies and will be able to take that back. And I think it's going to be hosted in a, in a, a really traditional uh, way, which is really, really exciting. So you're the father of four and you're the grandfather of six now. And after all your time as head of state, what are some of the things that you hope for their future and for future generations globally? Uh, between uh, my wife, uh, Debbie, and I, we do have a baseball team. Uh, <laughs> uh, with, uh, so, uh, but uh, seriously, I, I worry about the future, uh, Laura. Uh, mm -hmm. And so uh, being out of the government is not, doesn't mean that uh, I'm going to sit still. Uh, we've, uh, the family has worked together to put up the Ramangsao Foundation in which I still hope to be actively involved in, uh, in our culture and, and how it relates to the environment and working with our youth and, and connecting the, the need for uh, awareness and for the young people to take matters and, and actions into their hands also. So the, this will be, keep me quite busy, but uh, yes, I do enjoy uh, myself uh, these days, uh, sometimes, or most of the time, I should say, uh, out in the ocean. Um, but uh, my gosh, uh, I look at the, at the kids and uh, I do hope uh, their children uh, come into a world uh, that I found uh, and that I will still be able to enjoy or the natural resources, the environment, and, and, and the loveliness uh, of, uh, of a pristine uh, environment. Mm -hmm. uh, I think a wise man once said, uh, you, you don't know how lucky you are until it's gone. And, and, that, and that's so true for many of the good things in life. We, we take them for granted, and it's only when you lose them that you say, oh my gosh, uh, I should have done this. So. Mm -hmm. That's, uh, that's, the, that's the hope that I have, is looking at the children, the grandchildren, and hoping that they, you know, they grow up and take matters indeed into their own hands. If I may, you are a wise man yourself. I'm, a, I'm an indigenous myself, a, 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 an indigenous person myself, and we, you are what we call a wise man. Um, is there a word of encouragement that you could have as an incredible, the, the incredible leader you've been and the incredible impact you've had and our audience today is made also of, of, of leaders. Is there a word of encouragement that you could have for the leaders present today? I would say, uh, listen to, to the voices of the children. Uh, be concerned about their future. Um, let's not be selfish. Uh, let's not be materialistic. There are very, very important uh, values of life. There are very important uh, health issues. There are very important uh, um, 
developments uh, that relies on us not only making the right decisions, but sometimes even holding back uh, on some things so that we can achieve the long-term picture. Um, that's, uh, that's my uh, plea to every leader is, uh, is to think about the children first. And it makes a lot of difference. Thank you for that. Thank you. I have one last question, if that's okay. Um, so you touched upon it a little bit. Um, now that you're out of office, you say that you have returned to life as a fisherman, which your wife can attest to, apparently. And I just, I know that you're building your foundation, um, but I wondered if you could talk about the traditional role that you've taken on as well to help support Palau. Well, Yes, Laura. Uh, so beside the foundation, uh, I, I'm, I was able to be nominated and confirmed by my clan to also be a traditional uh, chief in my home state of Marard. Mm -hmm. So that automatically puts me as a, a traditional um, uh, chief member of the Council of Chiefs uh, uh, that advises the president on matters of uh, culture and course, uh, environment. So that'll get me busy. Um, the traditional uh, role uh, in Palau is still very much uh, observed and, and, and played out. Uh, although uh, we see the challenge of uh, uh, the rule of uh, democracy and, and the rule of uh, uh, chiefly title, but uh, the key word here is respect. As long as there's respect for the individual rights and there's a respect for what a, a traditional chief can also bring to the table, the world will be a, a lot better place. And uh, again, uh, a lot of the good traditions, a lot of the good cultural practices uh, should not be forgotten, should not be, be eliminated, but actually practiced by the young people and I hope to be uh, a part of that uh, uh, ongoing knowledge transfer to the young people. That's so wonderful. And I wish more countries had a strong traditional leadership that put the, yeah, the needs of their environment, culture and children first, advising their heads of state. I think we would all be in a much better place if we had wise people like you doing that. So thank you so much, Nora. I don't know whether you had any further questions. Um, no, just just wanted to thank you again for for both for being part of this of this panel. Ocean conservation is such an important, as you mentioned, Laura. It's such an important aspect of all our lives, and um, I, I feel like there's so much to 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 learn from the Palauan presidency and the the role that you've had in preserving the ocean, but also inspiring other leaders to implement, in particular, the pledge, which Laura will tell us more about. Um, but the pledge has, has been such an inspiration for so many, and I feel like it, it is time. It is definitely an idea that the time has come, and I hope that more countries are inspired by you, uh, dear President Tamir Mangasau. Uh, thank you for, for all your inspiration and being here with us today. And Laura, I, I'm looking forward to hear more about the pledge itself and see how we can have it duplicated everywhere if possible. That would be wonderful. That would be wonderful. If we could duplicate the Palau National Marine Sanctuary and the Palau Pledge, that would be, that would be the best. That's, that's the goal. That's the plan. I'm going to try. We're going to try together to do that and, and continue to be inspired by you, Mr. President. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nora. Thank you, Laura. God bless. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. What an incredible what an incredible presentation from uh, Laura Clark and uh, former president Tommy Ramengasau. It is now an honor for me too to present to you what the pledge is. The Palau Pledge is a unique, one of a kind approach to getting a new relationship with nature. We talked about mindset yesterday and how in order for us to change, we need to change our mindset. The Palau Pledge is an invitation that you get as soon as you arrive on the Palau land in your visa, on your passport. It invites you to have a different relationship and look at nature in a different way. This is the pledge I took. 
you, of course, uh, were not living in Palau, but we can take that pledge every day, just like I did. I try to have a different relationship with nature. I've decided to treat nature as I would treat a loved one. And I very much invite you to do the same. Your relationship with nature will change and your mindset will change. And as a reminder, some important data about the ocean. Scientists estimate today that 50 to 80% of the oxygen production on Earth comes from the ocean. I think it is important and vital to remind us of this data in a time where in 2020 we've experienced what the lack of oxygen means to all of us. And now, without further ado, I invite you to see the Palau Pledge. Now, if you're heading to the Pacific island of Palau, you'll be signing up to a new pledge. Human impact on Earth's environment is one of the biggest challenges facing the world today. The small island nation of Palau was feeling these impacts acutely. Tourists were damaging reefs, littering oceans and poaching protected species, their careless behaviour magnified by large numbers. But how could a small local population with limited resources police the high volume of visitors? What if we made the tourists police themselves? Introducing the Palau Pledge, a first-of-its-kind immigration policy for good. All visitors now need to sign an environmental pledge to gain admittance into Palau. Stamped into the passport of international arrivals, the pledge is a formal promise to Palau's children. Children of Palau. I take this pledge. To preserve and protect your beautiful and unique island home. To implement this policy, government, the tourist industry and citizens were brought together. A new visa entry stamp was designed and issued in multiple languages, and immigration processes were changed. The jolt that comes with the pledge is the recognition that, hey, I can make a difference. But we didn't stop at the passport stamp. We redesigned the tourism experience via a website, an in-flight film, a passport insert, local education, business accreditation, signage, penalties and collateral. Launched at the UN, the Palau Pledge has been praised by international leaders and groups. Influencers helped inspire people to take the pledge online in solidarity with Palau. Are you already seeing tourists behaving differently? The awareness level is very high. The reaction on social media has been widespread. The Palau Pledge has raised global awareness of the responsibility this generation has to the next. But its biggest impact is local, in Palau. I hope my children can see the beautiful place as I see today. How amazing is this pledge? It's, a, it's such an inspiring pledge and I, I hope that um, the team working behind the pledge and myself will continue, uh, will help in, in making this pledge being duplicated and particularly in places where there's a high, high touristic um, influence. Um, group participation is important and the collective awareness is very important. So I really hope that you enjoy the Palau Pledge and that you try to duplicate it in your own way. Um, the conversation will continue uh, with Léa Doriol, the founder of Oceanic Global, um, and that will continue tomorrow on live TV. And we will also have a conversation with Laura Clark tomorrow as well. So please stay tuned for more on how we can all help in the, our ocean conservation and most importantly, as um, Alexandra Cousteau mentioned, how we can restore our ocean. Thank you so much for being present today for day two of Change Now. <laughs>